good morning and open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the title of the sermon this morning is Outnumbered. Israel has never been a large nation, yet at times in history, they have been the dominant nation in their area. All the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, as Moses was preparing to you know, turn the children of Israel loose under the command of Joshua and to enter the promised land, God gave Israel some instructions through him on how to conduct warfare as they were going to go in and conquer certain nations. But not only that, after they had conquered the promised land and they were a dominant nation, how do you deal with other nations? How do you go to war? And we find that there may be some surprising things that are told to a people about to go to war. And so we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter number 20, verses 1 to 9. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God, he is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house, and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle, and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard, and hath not eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife, and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in battle, and another man take her. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. And it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. Again, this may be a strange reading, but what to do when your army is bigger than you? Because did you pick that up there in verse 1? It, he, he says here, when you go out to battle against your enemy and you see horses and chariots and people more than thou, be not afraid. You can clearly see that you're outnumbered, you're under-equipped as you go into battle, but hey, do not be afraid. And we're going to kind of skip for just a moment the reason why they weren't supposed to be escaped or to be afraid. But if we think about it, after they're told, don't be afraid, what do they get? They get a pep talk from the priests. It's not the general, it's not the leaders, it's the priests that come and give them a pep talk saying, hey, you're going to be okay, we're going out into battle, you see that this day you're going into battle, and this is the situation that you're going into, but don't be afraid. And then after the priests get done talking, before they go into battle, the officers now go through the camp and they say, hey, does anybody have a new house that they just built and you haven't dedicated that house? Well, you're excused from battle. Go home. Now, remember at the beginning, they're outnumbered, right? You've just told part of your army, go home. And then he says, well, hey, wait a minute. Have any of you planted a new vineyard and haven't eaten from it yet? So nobody else gets to eat from your labor. Hey, go home. You're excused from battle. And oh, by the way, is anybody betrothed to a wife and hasn't gotten you know, married to her yet? You can go home too. And then very last, anybody afraid? You can go home. Yeah, kind of a, we're about to go into battle. Who's not going to be afraid, right? Well, why do they not want the people who are afraid to be there? You look there again, uh, verse 8 
He says, officers shall speak further and say unto the people, they shall say, what man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Did you know fear is contagious? These are people that are looking at the problems. They're looking at the army. They're looking at the outnumbered part of it. And they're going, there's no way we can do this. We're all going to die. Send that guy home. Because... He's going to make everybody else think we can't do this. He's going to bring down everybody else. He's going to cause everybody else's heart to faint. So he says, send that person home. But now, the great part of the message. Let's go back and pick up. Why were they not to be afraid? Why were they not to be afraid? God was with them. That's exactly right. You, you can respond. It's okay. I like it. It lets me know you guys are awake, right? It's okay. God is with them. Yeah, right? Verse 1. The end of part after the colon, it says, For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of Egypt. And the priests were supposed to say, Let not your hearts faint, fear not, do not tremble, neither be ye terrified of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you and against your enemies and to save you. It is Jehovah God. Jehovah your God, personal relationship, is with you. And he's got some power. Because remember, he brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, you have to put this back in context. Who wrote the book of Deuteronomy? Moses, Moses right? So this is not too long after they've come out. Now, of course, they've wandered 40 years in the wilderness and all that kind of stuff. But as far as timeline in the Bible, relatively speaking... These are people that know about coming out of Egypt, and they know how they came out of Egypt. And what did they do to come out of Egypt? You guys are all looking at me strange. Exactly. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. They did not lift a finger to free themselves from Egypt. There was nothing they could do. Because, look, they were outnumbered by the Egyptian army, and they, had a, a, they weren't, look, they were not fighters. Later on, it talks about them being an agricultural people. They don't really have weapons. And the Egyptian army was one of the, the most elite armies of the world in their day. Yet God delivered them by his mighty power. Not only did he deliver them, but you remember, they went out with the great riches of Egypt. The scripture says they spoiled Egypt as they came out, the people of Egypt were giving them things, saying, get out of our land, we want you gone. Why? Because God had shown himself mighty. God had overcome their enemy. And so, again, if we think about the fearful heart, why are we sending the fearful in heart home? It's because those fearful in heart are not trusting in Jehovah God. The fearful of heart are not trusting in Jehovah, and they're going to get their friends not to trust in Jehovah, and they're going to get the people next to them not trusting in Jehovah. So the fearful could go home because they weren't trusting in Jehovah for victory. Well, you know, we have the same God today that Israel had. He's got the same power today that he had back then. And we can see that, you know, Israel was outnumbered at time. And they had the victory when God was with them and God fought for them. We could talk about all the different times that they were fewer in number. Uh, one that comes to mind, of course, is Gideon, right? Gideon with his 300 didn't even have a sword. They had trumpets and pitchers. And they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. And God caused the stir in the camp of the, I believe it was the Midianites back then. Okay? God got the victory. But, you know, similarly, Jesus tells his followers there's going to be opposition in the world. Let's look at the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter number 15. John chapter 15. I want to begin in verse number 18. Okay. Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse number 18. Jesus speaking. If the world hate you, Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, 
the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Now, I, I read those scriptures because, uh, you know, it seems like the people of God want to think that the world's going to like them. You know, if we just get real friendly with them, if we just do some things to get real nice with them, they're going to be okay with us, and they're going to accept us, and then they're going to accept our message. The world and its system does not think the way God does. They don't like Jesus. And if they don't like Jesus, and we're preaching Jesus, what's going to happen? The world's not going to like us either. As a matter of fact, that's what Jesus tells his disciples, right? If the world hate you, know that it hated me before it hated you. This is another thing that we understand from the scriptures, right? Jesus didn't come when mankind was going to be nice to him. And Jesus didn't come when mankind was going to be friends with him, right? He came unto his own and his own received him not. He came unto us while we were his enemies, but God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. While we were the enemies of God, he loved us. So stop and think about that. The world is always the enemy of Jesus. And if we're going to be on Jesus' side, that means the world and the world's systems and the world's governments are going to hate us. Not because of us personally, but because we stand and we represent the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not greater than our Lord. Remember verse 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And what did the world do with Jesus? They crucified him. Now, thankfully, we still have freedom where we are today, but there are people that die for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus lets us know there's going to be opposition. And just to be honest, the opposition outnumbers us. Those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not a majority. We are going to be in the minority, but there's hope. Go over to chapter 16 of the Gospel of John. God, Gospel of John. I'm getting ahead of myself. John chapter 16, verse number 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. Stop there. Where do we find our peace? It's not in the world. It's not in the world because the world's going to offer us turmoil. The world's going to offer us persecution. The world is going to offer us a lot of other things, and it's not going to be peace. But where do we find our peace? It's in Christ Jesus. He says, I have spoken these things to you. I've given you these reminders. I've given you these teachings. I've given you this word that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the end, the ultimate victor is not going to be the world's systems and the world's governments and the world's way of doing things. In the end, the victor is going to be Jesus Christ. He has already overcome the world, right? And so we can have our peace and our security in him. It is he that is with us. It is he and in his strength that we fight the battles that we're in. Now, unlike Israel, we don't fight physical battles, but we do fight spiritual battles. The scriptures tell us, tells us that we are engaged in a spiritual warfare, and we have to put on the armor of God. But notice, again, the strength comes from Jesus Christ. Go over to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I want to begin reading in verse number 12. Well, let's, let's back up. I, I always do this, don't I? Let's back up. Verse 10, Paul writing to Timothy, and he says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. And we've done our Sunday school study, what happened to Paul in Iconium and Lystra? 
That's where he was stoned and left for dead, right? Timothy knew about those things. Timothy knew those things. So he says, you know about the persecutions and afflictions that came unto me and what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Verse 12 now is where we're going to start. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I want to underline that again. Paul uses some very inclusive words here. Yea, and all. What does that mean? All. It means all. It means every single one. Every single one that will live godly in Christ Jesus. If you are going to live godly in Christ Jesus, how does the world feel about you? If the world hated Jesus, it's going to hate us. If the world system hated Jesus, it's going to hate us. And so the promise here is, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Some more severe than others, but all will suffer persecution. And again, why? Because they are living godly in Christ Jesus. Isn't it good to live godly? I mean, stop and think about that for a minute. Wouldn't you want to have godly neighbors? Mm -hmm. I would, but you know, then again, I'm a citizen of heaven. <laughs> If you wanted to be the low-down scoundrel sinner that you want to just go down and do all the things the world wants to do and you got a godly neighbor, what's going to happen? <laughs> They're going to cramp your lifestyle, right? They're going to convict you. They're going to be so nice to you, it's going to drive you mad. <laughs> At least that's what the Christian should do, right? But all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived, but continue thou. You that are going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you continue in the things which you have learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Where did Timothy learn what he learned? Some of it was from Paul, but some of it was from, read on, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. You remember he had a mother and a grandmother, Lois and Eunice, that raised him in the admonition of the Lord. But from a child he knew the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What do the scriptures tell us? Salvation is by grace through faith. But not only that, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If we have the scriptures, we have everything we need to live godly in Christ Jesus. That's what that says right there. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for all those things that the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished. We have everything we need to do what? Unto all good works. We hold to the scriptures. And we have everything that we need to do what God would have us to do. And so we also do not need to be afraid. Go over to the book of 1 John, chapter number 5. 1 John, chapter number 5. Verse number 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Why was the fearful Israelite allowed to go home? Because he didn't have faith in Jehovah. And they didn't want that lack of faith spreading around. Well, guess what we have today? We have victory, but it's victory because of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has overcome the world, and we can overcome the world by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we can go back to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
beginning in verse number 55. What's the worst thing this world can do to us? Kill you. Kill us. Right? All right, 1 Corinthians, with that thought in mind, 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? If they kill us, what happens? Nothing. <laughs> we get to go be with Jesus. And is our body going to stay in the grave? Nope, someday there's going to be a resurrection. The de uh, death has no hold over us. The grave has no hold over, over us. So what is there to fear? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, whenever there's a therefore in the Scripture, remember what it's there for, right? Find out what it's there for. Therefore, because we have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ, and our victory is in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What we do for the Lord matters. What we do for the Lord has eternal consequences. What we do for the Lord is the only thing that matters because what's going to happen to this world? It's all going to fade away. The things of this life, the world systems, they don't matter. There's nothing to fear in them because we have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because we have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can work for him, labor for him, and it's not in vain. We just keep doing what we're supposed to do. doesn't matter if we're outnumbered or not doesn't matter if they have more horses and more chariots. It is the Lord that goes with us. It is the Lord who goes before us. It is the Lord who empowers us. And it is the Lord who gives us victory. So when the enemy is strong and the obstacles seem insurmountable, you ever face a giant? When we're outnumbered, be not afraid. God is with his people. Not saying that we won't go through some hard times and we won't go through some persecution, but one of the things we can guarantee is the Lord will go through us, go with it, go with us through it. <laughs> God is with his people. And it is because of his power that we move, we breathe, and we have our being. He has overcome the world and he gives us victory. Therefore, if you're a child of God today, let us be faithful in the area of battle that he has called us to serve in. Little is much when God is in it. Let us also share with others how they too can have victory over death, hell, and the grave. It is not in their own strength. It is not in their own power. It is not trying to earn the righteousness of God. It is simply trusting the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. And then they can move without fear through life. Because perfect love casts out all fear. And that's how Jesus loves us. Perfectly. No fear of him dropping us. No fear of him rejecting us. Because he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We can move without fear because of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, our faith is our victory. With God, nothing is impossible. There is no odd too great. There is no, over, no mountain that we can't overcome without the Lord Jesus Christ. Or I should say, with the Lord Jesus Christ with us. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. He will prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for your word that you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement. We can learn from the Old Testament, Lord, that it was you who gave your people victory. There were times, Lord, when Israel outnumbered their enemies, and God, you had them be defeated because they were not with you. 
But God, we know that when you're with your people and your people were obedient and following you, you gave them the victory. And Lord, we thank you that you give us certain victory over death, hell, and the grave. You give us assurance of life with you through your scriptures and your promises that when we trust you in faith, believing who you are, believing you did what you said you did, and Lord, turning our lives over to you, that you give us the victory over those things. You give us salvation. You give us eternal life. And thank you for that. And Father God, we pray that others would come to know you before it's eternally too late. Before your children, Lord, as we deal with this world and as we look at the things that are around us, sometimes we feel like we're outnumbered. We feel a lot like Elijah. We're the only ones left. But we know, Lord, we're not the only ones left, that you have a great number of people. And even though the world may outnumber us, Lord, when you're on our side, there is nothing that can defeat us. Thank you again for blessing us and loving us. Just help us to take these scriptures to heart and to use them during our week. And God, I just pray you'd help us to be witnesses to those that are around us. Thank you again for loving us and blessing us. Be with us in the remainder of our service. We want to give you all the honor and glory and praise, Lord, because it is you that gives us the victory. It is you who shed your blood on Calvary. It is you who offered salvation through your love. And it is you who calls us to you. And so, Father, we just thank you for all that you do. And God, I just pray that your will will be done in each of our lives. And I ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.